Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up... The Federal Government confirms that 153 Tamils are in custody on an Australian customs ship. Signed on the dotted line, a free trade deal between Australia and Japan. And the perils of falling asleep at the baseball. And joining me on the panel, former Labor advisor Sean Kelly, Simon Cowan from the Centre for Independent Studies and in Canberra political editor with The Guardian, Lenore Taylor. And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag The Drum. Well, the Federal Government has confirmed that over 150 asylum seekers are now in custody on an Australian customs ship. Legal counsel for the Minister for Immigration has told the High Court that Tamil asylum seekers have no rights under the Migration Act because their boat was intercepted outside Australian waters. Refugee advocates are challenging the government's right to hand the asylum seekers back to Sri Lankan authorities. The federal government has given an undertaking it won't transfer the Tamils to Sri Lanka without giving the court 72 hours notice. The case has been adjourned till Friday. Earlier today, Prime Minister Tony Abbott said the High Court action will not prevent the government from stopping the boats. The Labor Party and its activists, uh, the Greens and their activists, uh, they will uh, try to disrupt the government's policies. They will try to do things that start the boats up again because uh, that's in Labor's DNA. Australians learn more about what its government, our government, is doing through international reports and rumour than from the government itself. I don't think that's acceptable. This is the very real risk of Australia handing over asylum seekers back to the very people uh, they are fleeing. Uh, it is wrong. It is unlawful. Lenore, what were the main arguments being put in the High Court today? Well, the lawyers bringing the case argue that by detaining the asylum seekers and taking them back to Sri Lanka, the government is breaching their obligations of non reform under the international treaties. The government seems to be arguing that because they were picked up outside of Australian waters, the Migration Act doesn't apply, and it's in that act that our international legal obligations are embedded. Um, it's not entirely clear yet, and I'm not a lawyer, but it seems that this might, at the end of the day, come down to a sort of extension of the question that was considered in the Tampa case during the Howard government years. And at that point, the High Court found that the government did have the prerogative power to um, detain and not allow those asylum seekers to come to Australia. Uh, but this is sort of taking it a whole step further because it's not just that the asylum seekers have been detained, but they've been taken back to the country from which they're fleeing. So I think there'll be a lot of complex legal arguments. We'll probably know more on Friday and then when the, um, the court resumes to hear the case proper. And, Sean, I'm, I'm guessing, mm. too, a bit, a bit of argument over whether due process was met on board one of those vessels... Oh, absolutely. Where, ..where they were asked a minimal amount of questions mm. without much legal representation. Four without questions. Anything. Just yeah. four questions. And this is what the government is calling enhanced processing. I mean, I think the words Orwellian and Kafkaesque are often overused in political debate, but this is a case where they absolutely uh, have a home ground. I mean, enhanced processing is one example, but the national interest test that the government decided to impose on whether or not people could get protection visas last week, permanent protection visas, has nothing to do with the national interest whatsoever. Entirely reverse engineered to ensure that anybody who arrives in this country by boat is apparently undermining the national interest. And meanwhile, the government continues to call people who arrive in this country entirely legally within Australian law and international law uh, illegal. I mean, this this is absolutely ridiculous. But we do seem to be getting... The government is testing the absolute limits of what mm. consequences it can bear in meeting that one slogan really more than a policy of stopping the boats and the legal and the diplomatic and the human rights consequences are mounting the government keeps saying that meeting that slogan that election promise you know justifies everything but, you know tony abbott was saying today oh, it's labor activists you know and greens activists well you know if the, the high court has now in as sean said in two cases cases coming up that really have profound 
could have profound effects on their ability to carry out their policies. You know, the High Court is the High Court. There is a separation of power. So we're sort of getting to the point where we'll see where the consequences might pot potentially end. I mean, so the fact that the government hadn't even confirmed before the case today that these 150 refugees on board this boat existed or that the government was in, it knew exactly where they were, the fact that we had to go to court to confirm that, uh, I think, points a picture, uh, paints a picture. All right, I don't want to get Simon's view on this. Is the government pushing it too far to meet that election promise? Look, uh, there's something important here that came up in the US in the the case against Obamacare, which is that the Supreme Court Chief Justice there said it is not the role of the High Court to absolve people from their political decisions. And what we saw at the last election were two parties who were running on quite stringent anti-refugee lines. And they were overwhelmingly voted for by the public. The party who was running on a pro-refugee, pro-onshore uh, settlement platform lost a significant amount of votes. So I think we need to accept that there is significant public interest in this debate, if nothing else. But Simon, the outcome of that argument is the High Court should rubber stamp anything governments want to do. Well, no, but the High Court should be very cautious before they intervene in what is, what is essentially executive and legislative powers. That's right, they should make a decision on whether or not the law is being met. Well, absolutely. But we also, I think, we need to look at the oversight of this regime separately to whether or not the government should have the power to do these things. And also, in the election campaign, I mean, the government and the opposition were both running on Stop the Boats. But there was no fi fine print that said, and that might involve, you know, leaving people for indefinite periods of time in detention in tropical places with no idea about their future. Oh, there was no I... fine print that said, you know, might mean we breach or potentially breach our international obligations and send people back to the place from which they were fleeing. I mean, the consequences of that very broad, bold promise were not spelled out. And I guess the point I'm making is to what extent, at what point will Australians say, OK, that consequence is a step too so far? Simon, quick response. I, look, I, I disagree with that this wasn't made clear to the public. I think, in fact, the government at the time made it very clear in advertisements that they placed across every newspaper in Australia that you were not going to get advantage by coming to Australia via boat, that you would never be settled in Australia. They did I think not say they were sending people back no, to where they were fleeing in, from. They in, did not indeed, say they that. They did not say that, but they certainly said those other things in very, very clear language. I think it's important that Australia examines its international obligations here, cognizant of the limits of international law, but I think it's also important that we respect the constitutional rights of the government and the constitutional authority of the parliament to make these decisions on behalf of the Australian people rather than investing that power in an unelected judiciary. Right, but the par well, just but one point. The Parliament actually made a decision to not have temporary protection visas and it's in order to get around that decision that they're in court on the question of the national interest test. Yeah. yeah. OK. We're going to move on because uh, <laughs> other big news today. Prime Minister Tony Abbott and his Japanese counterpart Shinzo Abe have signed an historic free trade agreement. The government says it will see the cost of Japanese cars and electrical goods fall and provide a boost to the beef industry. This morning, Mr Abe addressed MPs and senators in the House of Reps. For everyone everywhere, it means that two significant countries are prepared to put their hopes above their fears and declare their confidence in the future. Let us work forward together, Australia and Japan, with no limit. Yes, we can do it. The government insists the new trade deal will be a major boost for the economy, but others aren't quite so sure. This will generate, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, literally hundreds of thousands of jobs. No one can make a judgment about this agreement if the government continues to refuse to release it. This is an agreement that's already been negotiated. It's about to be signed. The only information Australians have is a five-page glossy pamphlet. I think they deserve more. It seems to be a bit of a one-way street uh, in that other countries seem to do much better out of these free trade agreements than we do. Now, I acknowledge that the sugar producers and uh, are happy and the dairy producers uh, could be vastly more happier than they were. Uh, but that is the reality of the cards we deal with. So I'm going to... Is Nick Xenophon right on this one? Do other countries do better out of free trade deals than we do? Absolutely not. And that's because we look at these things completely the wrong way. The first point we need to acknowledge is that bilateral free trade deals mean very little in economic terms because they are so narrow in terms of just operating on those two countries. The benefits of free trade, though, 
almost exclusively come from opening up your home markets and reducing the cost for suppliers of goods to people in your country. So in a sense he's right, this is a one-way street in that we are getting the benefit of lower prices for Japanese goods, lower prices for cars, lower prices for a whole range of other goods. That benefit will flow to our entire society across our entire economy. That is the real benefit from a free trade agreement. It's from lowering our barriers. It's not from artificially enabling other industries to participate in foreign countries. Okay, but if that's the case, why, when the Productivity Commission looked into this a few years back, did they say the six, uh, the first six free trade deals that we signed really made very little difference to trade and economic activity? Well, th that's exactly the point that I'm making. It's that these things are largely symbolic political documents and that the idea of global free trade and global free trade agreements where everyone lowers their barriers, there's a lot of benefit for that. The biggest benefit to Australia from free trade came from first Whitlam and then Hawke and then Howard progressively lowering the tariff barriers for Which goods you can in do Australia. without signing a Absolutely. deal. Absolutely, and you should do without signing a deal. That's why 75% of economists surveyed in 2011 said that Australia should unilaterally lower its trade barriers. Lenore, are these deals good for us? Well, I also come from the sort of starting point that free trade is a good thing and uh, that having cheaper imports and having more exports, you know, more opportunities for Australian exports is a good thing. It's a little hard to quantify if it's indeed quantifiable because the detail of this agreement was only re released, you know, just as I was coming into this studio and there's been no modelling, no quantification, no detailed analysis that we've seen. But you know, as a proposition, I think free trade is a good thing and we always argue over who's got the, you know, the better end of the stick in the negotiation. But even if the freer markets for Australian goods are opening up slowly and gradually, it still means there's more opportunities for exporters. Even if the cheaper cars are only gradually getting cheaper, you know, it's still a good thing. Um, I think one interesting thing that was reported today, I think, in the Financial Review was that the Abe government is also pushing for a um, rethink of the investment mandate for the $1.4 trillion pension scheme in Japan with the potential that it might invest more in uh, offshore markets and particularly in infrastructure. And you can see that that might, in fact, really dovetail well with the government's emphasis on infrastructure and private investment in infrastructure. Yeah, true. Sean, uh, what's your view on this one? <laughs> oh, boring unity ticket. These things are, are basically <laughs> good, even if they're not quite as good as governments usually claim. But I think the really interesting part of today was watching the Prime Minister try to handle China and try to reassure China. Because ultimately, while this deal is a little bit important, the, the biggest influence on our uh, growth through Asia over the next few years is going to be the ongoing relationship between the United States and China, their battle for dominance in the region. And every time you see discussions like today over uh, Chinese-Japanese territorial disputes. That's really a proxy for China and the US being at war over the dominance of this region. OK, well, it's a once-in-five-year event. Tomorrow, Indonesia goes to the polls to elect its next president. Two candidates are in the running to take over from Cicillo Bangbang Yudhiyono. Bonnie Simons-Brown takes a look at who they are and what they stand for. <laughs> In the last 15 years, Indonesia has made a successful transition from authoritarian regime to thriving democracy. Now the country's 187 million eligible voters are preparing to choose a new leader in only the third direct presidential election since dictator Suharto was ousted in 1998. It's a two-horse race that's impossible to call. On one side, Joko Widodo, the governor of Jakarta, whose humble beginnings and hands-on leadership style endeared him to Indonesians fed up with the current stable of political elites. Jokowi, as he's known, is backed by the populist Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle and, until recently, held a commanding lead in public opinion polls. Up against him, Prabowo Subianto, a former Special Forces commander accused of human rights abuses in East Timor and of ordering the kidnapping of pro-democracy activists during the final days of Suharto's reign. Prabowo founded the strongly nationalist Great Indonesia Movement Party in 2008 and has spent millions on what is now his third bid for the presidency. <laughs> When polls open on Wednesday morning, around a third of all voters will be casting a ballot for the first time. Young Indonesians are increasingly well-educated and politically informed and will play a critical role in shaping the country's future. Basically, I want transparency. I want 
uh, my voice to count like afterwards after the election like what would happen then can we ask for accountability can we ask for transparency Indonesia is at a crossroads Southeast Asia's largest economy has tapped into its wealth of natural resources and fostered a burgeoning middle class but growth is slowing and the gap between rich and poor is widening Voters are torn between protectionist policies they believe will stop Indonesia's wealth trickling offshore and their desire to usher in a progressive new era that will deliver better outcomes for the many who live in poverty. Whoever is elected the country's next president, Indonesia is set for a dramatic change in direction which could have profound consequences for Australia. Bimanto Suostoyo is head of news services at Barita Satu Media Holdings in Jakarta and joins us now. Bimanto, thanks so much for talking to us. Hi, welcome. Initially, it appeared that Joko Widodo would win this contest easily, then Prabowo fought back in the polls. What's the latest yeah. you're hearing? What's the likely outcome? It's a mixed, it's a mixed uh, result between the polls, but uh, one thing that you can only be sure is that uh, it's a very tight race. Um, nothing sure for the moment. OK, well, let's talk about Prabowo first. He um, has admitted previously to kidna kidnapping uh, student activists during the Sahata uh, regime, the final days of that regime. Mm. The US would not grant him to a visa when he wanted to visit there to see his son graduate. Um, there must be concerns about what kind of, kind of leader he will be and um, how he will be accepted on the international stage if he won. Yeah, uh, concerns are there, but... Uh, what, what people must also realize that uh, nobody actually knows the, the exact story behind that. So he might share the blame. I'm sure he does, but uh, there might also be others. So it's not only fully his only blame, uh, his only side to blame. OK, so how come he hasn't come clean during a presidential election on that issue? Uh, you see, I've, I've repeatedly said that Although a uh, human right issue is, uh, is something important for, for those who care for it, but uh, in general in Indonesia, it's, it, play, it takes second place to other things, a lot of things even. Uh, economic well-being, like welfare, whatever. OK, let's talk about uh, Joko Widodo. Um, does he have the experience mm -hmm. to, to run the, third, the world's third largest de democracy? And can he follow through with his plans and his policies to crack down on corruption? Well, I, I'm, I'm not there to judge him, but I can only show what he has done so far, which is uh, Jakarta has got a very tight administration. It's very, uh, it's a clique, it's a mafia. It's very hard to, uh, to go through it. And uh, he actually did manage to uh, instill changes there. He's, uh, he's managed to uh, turn the, uh, the administration efficient. And that, for me, is a proof that he can do things at, the, at a higher level. It's, it's just the capability to introduce change, mindset change. He's had some difficulties during this campaign, hasn't he, uh, with smears. There have been um, uh, people suggesting that he uh, was a Christian, not a Muslim. Uh, there have been people yes. attacking, attacking him. How has he dealt with those claims? Yes, yes, that, that certainly has taken a toll to, uh, on his camp. Uh, it's, it's rebounding now, his, uh, his popularity uh, in the last... I think the last two surveys that he's, uh, he's moving up again, but not by much. How will the Indonesia-Australia... The... Sorry to interrupt, but how will the Indonesia-Australia no. relationship change uh, according to who wins? Uh, not in the short term. Not in the short term. Not in one year or two years. After three years, it may change. Uh, people will be busy... Any new leader will be busy solidifying his... Uh, his power inside the country rather than outside. And then we will start dealing with outside afterwards. All right. The, the American journalist Alan Nan has raised the prospect of ballot tampering during this election uh, as part of what he describes mm. as an orchestrated military operation. Are there any concerns that tomorrow's election will be anything but free and fair? Uh, there, there will be money politics involved. Tampering to that level, I don't think so. Uh, there's too many people on the, on, uh, on polling station, for example. Uh, we have seen that in the in the legislative election already. Uh, there was not as much tampering as, for example, like 2009 or 2004. 
Uh, this time, I don't think uh, it will be at that scale. There will be uh, cheating, of course, but uh, I think it will still remain within reasonable uh, levels. Okay, when you say cheating, like how, how widespread? Well, cheating in the sense that, you know, we found already some, some ballots that have been marked, pre-marked. Uh, you see people influencing at the, before they go to the poll, for example, with money, things like that. But I think in general, uh, it is still within a, what is it, uh, acceptable level in that sense, uh, that it's not so widespread, I think. We can just look at the last legislative election, for example, for me. Bimanto, thanks so much for joining us tonight on The Drum. You're welcome. Bimanto Suastoyo there from Jakarta. Motoring enthusiast Senator Ricky Muir will introduce amendments to the carbon tax repe repeal bills in order to save the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Muir's amendment would stop the immediate $435 million funding cut announced by the Coalition. A spokesman for the Victorian Senator said it was the first step in an attempt to keep the agency. The move could spell more trouble for the federal budget, with the government banking on saving $1.3 billion by scrapping the agency. Lenore, did this uh, come a bit, as a bit of a surprise? Because this puts uh, Ricky Muir in line with Green's policy, doesn't it? Well, it's kind of a surprise a minute with this new Senate, really. You know, yesterday we had $9 billion worth of surprises. So, yes, it did come as a bit of a surprise. I think um, Ricky Muir was obviously looking to sort of you know, insert himself into this process, make a name for himself. I think there's a number of the crossbenchers that aren't as hostile towards renewable energy and programs around renewable energy as they might be towards the carbon tax itself. So it's kind of complicated what he's doing. The, but the carbon tax repeal bills have this first cut to the uh, Renewable Energy Agency's funding. And in the first instance, he's trying to amend them so that that doesn't happen. But then he says he's also... He would vote against the bill that's coming up in September, which is going to try and axe the arena, the Renewable Energy Agency, altogether. And there are other crossbenchers who are looking at, at that as well. I think uh, Senators Xenophon, Madigan, are uh, thinking about their position, and the three of them together would be enough to to block that bill. So, Sean, it's sounding like uh, these crossbenchers want to get rid of the carbon tax, but they don't necessarily uh, want to go along with the rest of the, the government's climate policy. Yeah, it doesn't seem as if they know exactly what they want at this point, but I think it is a real problem for Tony Abbott, the fact that across the Senate, all of the parties, all of the independents are indicating an absolute willingness to stand in the way of significant parts of his agenda. And that is a problem for him. Prime Ministers like to think and they like to tell their party rooms uh, that the public will blame an obstructionist Senate but they don't. The public expects governments to govern. They expect prime ministers to deliver on their agendas. That's why Kevin Rudd ultimately suffered for not delivering on the emissions trading scheme, even though it was the Liberal Party and the Greens which blocked it in the Senate. It's why John Howard was so determined to negotiate successfully with the Democrats to get his GST through, even though it wasn't the ideal GST that he would have wanted. Those two politicians knew, one found out the easy way, one found out the hard way, that the public wants governments to actually be able to deliver, and it's Tony Abbott who will wear the flak for that. Simon, is a good policy that Ricky Muir is pursuing here? The arena is set up to uh, help invest in renewable energies, to help research in renewable energies? Uh, unfortunately, what arena is set up to do seems to be to duplicate a lot of the functions that exist elsewhere, like, for example, the CSIRO, the functions that Commercialisation Australia was undertaking, uh, even, to an extent, the the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which has exactly the same role, to invest in technologies and to invest in, in renewable energy programs. I mean, basically what we've got is we've got a whole lot of duplication across these agencies. Now, the challenge that I think the government is facing is that they have not yet made the case to the public as to why these agencies aren't doing something that they should be doing or that they, they should be abolished. And, and what we've seen is I think the government assumed that the crossbench senators would support them on these areas because they're largely right-wing and so they, they thought they'd have that support. Um, they haven't been able to secure that support. And as Lenore said, what we've seen is each of those senators are trying to make their mark in different ways. Even today, we saw Jackie Lambie trying to divert foreign aid away from overseas countries and be sent instead to Tasmania. 
um, Lenora, on that issue that Simon raised there, is there duplication in these areas when it comes to renewable energy? Is the government right to, to be wanting to trim these, these uh, agencies? Well, they're not trimming. They're trying to get rid yeah. of them altogether. And the um, arena was set up actually to remove duplication. It's actually an amalgamation of a whole lot of different programs that were there, largely for sort of start-up and, and um, commercialisation funding, which is different from what the Clean Energy Finance Corporation does. It's, it's helping to just get finance for uh, big projects that are ready to go. So they do have slightly different functions uh, and, you know, I think they both have really valid functions. Um, the problem is now we don't have the overarching carbon policy that's going to sort of drive the market towards uh, needing and, and requiring those kind of renewable energy products. So, you know, there's the big question underneath it all, but these programs still fulfil a valid role, I think. Well, I think it's an important question here, though, and we really need to ask, is it the role of government to be out there interfering with start-up businesses, trying to run those businesses, trying to interfere with, with market processes where there is no evidence of a failure of support for small businesses in this country. We have an enormous amount of support for small businesses here. Why is it that we need another body set up specifically well, to interfere with that process? I mean, the, that's, a, that's a legitimate question, I think. Should we have this sort of assistance? If the government thinks there's a legitimate reason for these particular types of business, then absolutely there's a role. I think the bigger problem here is that we have we have no climate change policy anymore. Mm. I mean, direct action is an absolute joke, but it's looking now like we're not even going to have that. We're obviously not going to have a carbon tax. It's looking unlikely that we'll have any structure in place for an emissions trading scheme. And because of a decision uh, by the Greens last week that I still can't understand, uh, we're not going to have even a tax on petrol as proposed by the government. Uh, so we have, we have no climate change policies in this country anymore, and I think that is desperately sad, and I think it will hurt our economy significantly as the rest of the world moves to emissions trading. Schemes. So, I mean, is that where we, we're at now? Oh, I, I think there's an absolute confusion in a lot of areas, and it's not just climate change. The entire budget strategy is completely under threat from whatever the whims of Clive Palmer and, and his senators are, and then the influences of the crossbench. I mean, we've even seen, you know, Bob Day and David Leinhelm are looking at uh, the welfare changes to, for young people and diverting that instead into reforms in industrial relations. Opening up that can of worms would be yet another headache for this government. There's a lot of chaos and confusion here. Here. Well, but for I mean, more there's... on the Upper House, head to the Drum website for a piece from Chris Berg about why he thinks the commentary on the new Senate has become patronising. Well, that is all about all the time we've uh, got for tonight for the Drum. Thanks very much to our panellists, Sean Kelly, Simon Cowan and Lenore Taylor. Tomorrow on the show we'll have a, a top panel for you. Jenny McAllister and Peter Collins are my guests. Now you can ch check out any of the articles written on the Drum website at abc.net.au slash the drum. And we'll see you again at the same time tomorrow night. Catch you then.